Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Chatham Christian Church. Let's all sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Delighted to see you scattered throughout the auditorium safely this morning. Uh, delighted that you've come, and we're celebrating together uh, the goodness of God and the joys we share in Christ. Uh, we welcome those who are watching at home as well, and uh, we sense your presence. We trust you're seeing us and sensing ours, and as the body of believers, we're celebrating the joys we have in Christ uh, with confidence today. And uh, what's going on? What kind of special things are happening in your life? Any celebrations? Yes? Gabe turns eight on Saturday. Gabe, eight years old? Happy birthday, Gabe. All right. Any other celebrations? Yes? Gloria, Gloria has a birthday tomorrow. Gloria, Gloria has, has a birthday. birthday tomorrow. Tell her happy birthday for us. Or we'll tell her if she's watching. Happy birthday, Gloria. There you go. What else this morning? Yes? Tomorrow, our uh, almost our brook keeper, our parents, uh, she goes into the hospital to have our first grandchild. So, uh, all, right. all right, all right. She's uh, the dead button, I guess, is the uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, Mike and Kelly are going to become grandparents tomorrow. Tomorrow. Woo! All right. Congratulations. Congratulations, guys. That's awesome. What else this morning? Anything else? All right. Well, Mark and Tina are vacationing. Uh, they'll be coming back tomorrow. 
Uh, after the service today, uh, the Winterborgs and Hunleys are going to head to Colorado. A chance to show my grandkids the mountains. I am really excited. Uh, the only downside is it won't be on the back of a motorcycle. But uh, we're going to pack into a van and have a great time together and uh, look forward to that. Mark will be preaching uh, next week, so you can count on that. And uh, again, we're delighted that you've come this morning. Uh, we have a time of praise together, and let's just continue celebrating. don't fight these hands that are holding you. When Jesus appeared to his, dis his disciples after the resurrection, he gave them peace and he calmed their fears and then he showed them his hands. He did this to convince them who he is and what he had done for them. Then he opened their minds so they could understand and said, 
The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. And then he lifted his hands to bless them. The hands of Jesus show us that he is by our side and that our hands can be made clean. God, we come to you in worship. We focus all that we are on you. And God, we praise your glorious majesty through these songs. And may the whole world know that you are a living God and that your sacrifice and victory brings us eternal joy and everlasting peace and endless celebration. We praise you, God, for loving us, and we thank you for accepting us as your children. 
Lord, you showed your love for us by living as a, a shining example. You saved us by dying in our place. You have taken our sins away, and you rose to reveal your glory to reign forever. And we long for the glorious day of your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin.
indeed that glorious day is coming. And uh, as the scriptures teach us, come Lord Jesus. That's our prayer. That's our prayer. As we come to a time for uh, prayer this morning, we need to uh, discern if there are needs that we can take before the throne together. Uh, I did have a phone call from uh, Mindy, and she's requesting prayer for a good friend of hers whose 17-year-old daughter uh, has a, a mass on her thyroid. Uh, the first doctor basically just gave her bad news, and they went and checked another doctor, and he said there's hope. And uh, so we're, we're praying that uh, healing can come and that uh, she can be restored. Uh, very, very thankful for Mindy allowing us to share in that this morning. Shar, I'm sure you've got some things to share this morning. Or? I had the urinary infection now. Uh, yeah. My husband is not allowed to have sex with anyone else. So okay. okay, Lee is still having some, uh, some physical struggles. Uh, he has been uh, admitted over to the bridge and uh, had to run into the hospital quickly yesterday, but hopefully things are getting squared away. Uh, some trouble getting medications balanced and uh, getting him balanced. Uh, let me pray for you, Shar. Uh, we know this is a very, very difficult time. Jenny requesting prayer for a good friend uh, just lost her husband uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, little children, uh, trying to prepare to go back into teaching, uh, a lot of issues, and uh, she doesn't have immediate family around her, but she's got God's family behind her, and thank you for sharing that with us, Jenny. Yes? So uh, your sister had a close call with a uh, hurricane? Okay. It's, okay, all right. There's a lot of concern about uh, the hurricane. Uh, I tell you, the weather is so unpredictable. Many of you are probably aware that we had a, a tornado down in Auburn for one minute on the ground. And in one minute, it completely destroyed the major uh, machine shed at the Hunley household. Uh, a lot of help came in the next day, got it all cleaned up. Now the equipment's being uh, gone over, and thankfully, Paul has the freedom to go with us to Colorado, <laughs> and uh, that was our biggest concern. <laughs> well, maybe not the biggest one, but uh, we're delighted for, for the help uh, that was received and for God's protection. Uh, the tornado was just, what, 50 yards from Paul's mom. Uh, she didn't even know it was happening. It was raining so hard. When the rain stopped, she looked out. And uh, the machine shed was in shambles, and everything was damaged, and it was a kind of a, a rude awakening. Uh, but very grateful again for protection. Yes, Burl. Belly and beers, having some heart issues, and going through my program. Okay, Belly and Beard. He was a, um, a very Im important part of our church family for many years, uh, lives down in Texas now, having some heart issues, and uh, so we pray for him. Also, my brother's grandson, young, has got the virus, and uh, he finds a way into his room at home, and uh, the rest of the family for 14 days. Okay, all right, all right. Merle is uh, requesting prayer for his brother, his grandson, uh, has tested positive, has, I'm sorry, eighth grade, okay, all right, so the family's in quarantine, we pray for them. Anything else this morning? Yes? Uh, my mind was uh, recovering from cancer treatment and contracted uh, COVID, not from around here, but this time. Okay. okay, all right, a friend of Jamie uh, in cancer treatment. Contracted COVID complicates things, and so we, we pray for him, Jamie. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. One of my, uh, the network administrators that I work with, 
Nancy requesting prayer for an administrator at work uh, undergoing treatment for cancer and uh, thank you for again allowing us to participate in that. Okay. Well let's pray together. Father we are grateful for your presence as, that is seen around us in nature and in life, in birth and even in, in death because in death we see the promise of eternal life. Thank you, Father, for Christ. Thank you for Jesus taking on flesh and dwelling among us and assuring us that there's a future laid out before us. As you're well aware, Lord, some uh, crazy things are going on in, in the world. It's nothing new. Things have been, been messed up since sin was invited to uh, enter into our lives. But you're still gracious. You're still in control. You still promise to bring good out of whatever happens if, if we trust you and are called according to your purposes. So we pray for faithfulness. We pray for courage. We pray for confidence uh, in the face of uncertain days. Thank you for uh, blessing us and protecting us. Thank you for caring for the needs of our church family and giving us the opportunity to pray for others and reach out with, with the love of Christ in some ways that hopefully can be, be seen and, and sensed and felt. Guide us now as we study your word. Prepare us to, to learn and to grow and to be challenged through Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, Mark does a masterful job putting together his gospel for us, which is not surprising since he has the guidance of the Holy Spirit to make his gospel truly inspired. The Spirit, however, doesn't overlook writers' abilities and personal style when working through them to record for us the Word of God. And as we've seen, Mark loved to use contrasts, and he intentionally arranged things in his gospel to make a point. The way he painted a picture of Mary's love for Jesus, set in the midst of pictures of the priest's hatred for Jesus and the treachery of Judas' betrayal, was like a rose among thorns. When he contrasted the way the disciples felt and dealt with the crisis of Jesus' arrest and the way Jesus dealt with it, we saw the difference between relying on the flesh or the Father. And in our text for today, Mark sets two scenes before going back to explore them and contrast them. Let's see what they are. Picking up our study in Mark 14. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and all the elders and the scribes gathered together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. Scene one will be played out in the upstairs quarters of the high priest's home. And scene two will take place in his courtyard. Now, Mark doesn't record for us Jesus' appearance before Annas, who had been high priest from 6 to 15 AD, before being deposed by Pilate's uh, predecessor. John gives us the details of that encounter. Mark merely takes us to the home of Caiaphas, Annas' son-in-law, who had been appointed high priest by the Roman authorities. Both most likely lived together in the same courtyard, and both were regarded as high priest. The Jews still regarded Annas as high priest because the Old Testament said the high priest was to serve for life, but Caiaphas had the official authority of high priest due to his appointment by Rome. According to Matthew, it was to his home that we see Jesus taken as a prisoner in the middle of the night. What happened upstairs 
will be a picture of what can happen when hate boils over. And in the courtyard, we'll see what can happen when love peters out. Now, the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were giving false testimony against him, and yet their testimony was not consistent. And some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. And not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. This trial was clearly a farce. The priests had decided to kill Jesus long before the trial was convened. Mark records that the chief priests and the whole council, the Sanhedrin, the council of 70 priests and elders that served as the Jewish Supreme Court, kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death. They sound like vigilantes of the Old West who would assure their victims they were going to get a fair trial right before the hanging. Not only was this trial a charade, it was also illegal. Jewish law required that trials take place during daylight hours. They weren't allowed to convene under the cover of darkness. But the priests were in a hurry to condemn Christ before the Sabbath, so they ignored that point of law. They also overlooked the fact that the Sanhedrin was to meet only in the hall set aside for its purposes, and only there could official business be conducted. But here they are, crammed into the high priest's living room, trying the Son of God. The most flagrant violation of the law would be seen when they passed sentence on Jesus. Because the Sanhedrin was prohibited by law from reaching a verdict on the same day that a trial was held. But again, they're in a hurry. And there was no doubt in their mind how this trial would end. Even if they did have a hard time finding witnesses to bring accusations against Jesus. The law required two or three witnesses whose testimony agreed before anyone could be tried for a capital offense. And they had the best witnesses money could buy. But they couldn't get their story straight. The closest they came was when a couple of them agreed that they had heard Jesus say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Now that's not what he said. What he had said nearly three years earlier was destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He didn't say he would destroy the temple and he wasn't even talking about the temple in Jerusalem. He was talking about his body. But that was as close as the witnesses could get to making an accusation against him. But even the kangaroo court realizes such misconstrued and inconsistent testimony wouldn't hold up before Rome and they needed something to take before Pilate because they didn't have the authority to execute anyone. So the high priest took matters into his own hand. And the high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus saying, do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. Jesus had wisely not responded to the ridiculous charges that were being leveled at him. There is a time to be silent. 
And Jesus knew better than to try to defend himself before a hostile crowd. In fact, it had been prophesied by Isaiah some 700 years earlier of the Messiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Even when the high priest asked why he didn't respond to his accusers, Jesus said nothing. But then the high priest did something that forced Jesus to speak. According to Matthew, the high priest put Jesus under oath and said, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. The Old Testament law didn't have a Fifth Amendment. In fact, according to Leviticus 5, when a person was put under oath, they had to answer even self-incriminating questions. So Jesus answered the question, I am. According to the other Gospels, there was more dialogue between Jesus and the priests at this point. He said, among other things, if I tell you, you will not believe, and you have said it yourself. But both Mark and Luke make it very clear that Jesus also said emphatically, I am. There are skeptics today who claim Jesus never openly said he was a son of God, that the church made that claim up after his death. But the skeptics have to disregard both Mark and Luke's account of Jesus' words to come to that conclusion. When put under oath and asked if he was the son of God, Jesus said, yes, I am. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Then Jesus said, And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest stood in judgment over Jesus that day. But the day was coming when the high priest would see Jesus coming in the clouds to sit in judgment over him. At that point, the high priest tore his clothes, feigning an expression of extreme grief, but in reality, a hypocritical act. He was delighted he had what he wanted, something to use against Jesus, blasphemy. Actually, it wasn't blasphemous to claim to be the Messiah, but that's another technicality. He could accuse Jesus of blasphemy, and if the others agreed, that's all they needed. Blasphemy, speaking sacrilegiously about God, was a capital offense in the Old Testament, punishable by death. Now all they had to do was get Pilate to carry it out, since they weren't allowed to do it themselves. They had what they wanted. They could rid themselves of Jesus, the object of their scorn and hatred. At that point, their hatred boiled over. It could no longer be concealed behind the facade of a trial. And the pillars of the church, the proud and pompous priests, began spitting on Jesus. Then they beat him. And since Isaiah 11.3 said the Messiah wouldn't judge by what his eyes saw or ears heard, they blindfolded him before beating him under the guise, I think, of testing his claim to be the Messiah. The Sanhedrin had become a mob of savage animals beating and taunting the Son of God. When they were finished, they handed him off to the officers who, taking their cue from the religious leaders, either slapped him in the face or beat him with rods. The word can mean either. What a picture! of human depravity and unbridled hatred. Something we sadly see even today on the nightly news. Indeed, hatred is an ugly thing. But the really sad thing is 
things. That there are times when love doesn't look much better. And Mark makes that clear in scene two. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You too were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. And the maid saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, This is one of them. But again, he was denying it. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you're talking about. And immediately a cock crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, Before a cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. No one can deny Peter's love for Jesus. He had pledged to die for him if need be. And he really meant it. True, he had run off into the night with the rest of the disciples after a bungled attempt to rescue Jesus with a sword. But he was back. He had followed from a distance and had gone right into the courtyard of the high priest and was warming himself around the fire with the very servants and officers he had drawn his sword against. Now, according to John, another disciple, who we assume to be John himself, was also there. In fact, he was the one who had enabled Peter to get in, being an acquaintance of the high priest and the doorkeeper. But where were the other disciples? Before we condemn Peter for his denial, we better remember that the others didn't deny Jesus because they were too afraid to even be there. But Peter was there. He loved Jesus and had promised not to forsake him. But then something happened he hadn't planned on. He was identified. According to John, it was the doorkeeper, a servant girl, who approached Peter, seeing him clearly in the light of the fire, and said, You too were with Jesus the Nazarene. Aren't you one of his disciples? Without thinking, Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. And he slinked into the shadows of the porch. At this point, some manuscripts add, and a cock crowed. I imagine he cringed, but quickly gained his composure and said to himself, I can't believe I did that. But then he did it again. Apparently the servant girl didn't give up. She began pointing to Peter and saying, this is one of them. Peter denied it with an oath. I swear, I don't know the man. Then, according to John, a relative of the servant girl whose or a relative of the servant whose ear Peter had sliced said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? She was sure he had. He even had a Galilean accent. At that point, Peter began to curse and swear. Now, that does not mean he began using profanities. It means he was calling down a curse upon himself, something like, may God strike me dead if I'm not telling you the truth. I swear I don't even know the man. Then a cock crowed a second time. And according to Luke, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. At that he remembered what Jesus had said, and realized what he had done. And he broke down in tears of grief over how he had failed his Lord. He couldn't believe it. How could anyone deny three times in the course of an hour or so the one they loved more 
than life itself? That, I think, is the question Mark would have us ask ourselves today. We expect hatred to be ugly. It really doesn't surprise us to see what the priests did. It's a little harder to face what Peter did. We tend to think love can conquer all. But then again, we have to admit we've seen love fail time and time again. How many marriages have collapsed after couples vowed never to forsake each other? How many times have we disappointed and hurt and even crushed the ones we love the most? How often do we shock ourselves by our unloving behavior directed toward the ones we love? What's wrong with our love? Quite frankly, the problem is it's our love. It's a love based on our emotional reservoir, on our resolve, and our personal commitments. That kind of love is not bad, but it does have its limits. Peter didn't think so. But he discovered the limits of his love in the high priest's courtyard. Chances are pretty good. We've discovered the limits of our love on occasion as well. So what do we do when love peters out? We follow Peter's example. We weep as he did. And then we let the resurrected Lord reassure us of his love and empower us with God's love. The love of God never fails. And he is always willing to love through us if we'll just let him. Peter learned that lesson the same way we do by coming back to him after failure. When your love is pushed to its limits, and even Peter's out, don't give up. Just go back to the source of divine love and let him do through you what you couldn't do on your own. Father, we come before you amazed by your love. A love that was in effect even before you created us. A love that knew that we would fail you. And a love that provided for our redemption through the sacrifice of his son. Thank you, Father, for love that goes far beyond anything we can express on our own. I'm thankful, Lord, for Peter's failure. It encourages us. He responded rightly to his failure. When he shocked himself by his behavior, he wept. And he came back to you. And you reassured him of your love. And you empowered him with a love of God that enabled him to go to a cross and be crucified upside down because he had within him the love of his heavenly father. Father, sometimes we, again, disappoint ourselves. And we disappoint you. But your love never fails. You love us enough to forgive us no matter what. Help us to love others the same way. In Christ's name we pray.
In Exodus, we read of the Hebrew people preparing to make their exodus from the land of Egypt in Exodus 12. The Lord, speaking to Moses, established a new feast that would be celebrated for many years to come. This feast commemorates the night when the Lord passed over the Israelite houses covered by the blood of the Lamb, saving the Israelites from the plague of the firstborn. The Lord told Moses to prepare for this feast seven days in advance by eating only unleavened bread. And not only that, but also they should remove all the leaven from the house on the first day. The Bible uses two different words when talking about leaven in these passages, and I think that makes for an interesting distinction. The first one, matzah, is a word you are probably familiar with. It's a word commonly used for unleavened bread even today, and it basically just means unleavened bread. The second word I had never heard of before, and I find it to have interesting application in our lives today. The word is seor, and it is the word for the leavening agent that is put into bread that makes it rise. According to Hebrew scholar Jonathan Wolfe, the root of this word means to be left over or to remain. It was the leftover dough the baker would leave out to ferment. And once fermented, it could be kneaded into the next batch and would cause the dough to rise. The Lord commanded the Israelites to remove the saor from their houses completely before they even began preparing for the Passover and the exodus that would follow. The Lord knew this exodus would have to be done in haste and there would be no time to allow any dough to rise. All the dough would be baked, and therefore nothing would remain behind to create the next seor. In the same way, nothing would remain of the Israelites' former life of slavery. And that is what I find so interesting about seor. I think God was telling the Israelites that their former life under Egyptian rule was gone for good. God was finally breaking Pharaoh's hardened heart, and they would be free. They could leave it all behind them. The Israelites only had to trust in the blood that covered their doorposts. And we need only to trust in the blood shed on the cross to free us. And just as the Israelites would have been gravely mistaken to return to Egypt, even though they did think about it, we too would deeply regret returning to our old life of slavery, even though sometimes we flirt with the idea as well. That life is gone, and we must leave it behind forever. And it is no wonder that Christ took the Passover and made it into the meal we celebrate today. Not only do we look to the cup and see the blood of Christ that allows judgment to pass over us, but also we can look to the bread, the body of Christ, and realize we never have to go back to the life of slavery to sin ever again. Christ even showed us how we can do this. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It is Christ's wish that you no longer remain in your former life, but that you remain in him. One of the ways we do this is by coming around this table every Sunday to remember our Lord Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, we read, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This, is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's do just that this morning.
for showing us that you will cover our sins, that you will forgive us no matter how time, no matter how many times we need it. Lord, we ask that you give us the strength to, to run away from our sin and to run to you. Help us, Lord, to devote our lives, all of our lives, to serving you. We thank you for the forgiveness that you give us. We thank you for the love that you have shown us. And we thank you for being a, a mighty, majestic God. It's in Jesus' name we pray.